Hi everyone, welcome to the fourth uh, edition of our introduction to the ASX uh, sessions. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, what we'd like to talk about today is um, probably two major topics around analysis of shares. And, and one of the crucial things that we get asked is um, ultimately is how does a, um, how do research analysts um, work out whether they should be buying BHP or Rio Tinto or um, Woolworths for that matter. And there are two major um, methods that uh, analysts use. And the one that um, I'll talk about first is called fundamental analysis. Um, and the second one is technical analysis. And fundamental analysis in a nutshell we'll talk about early on is about um, working through the fundamentals of the shares, um, whether they have good management, what type of um, business they have, um, whether they're in a good sector. Um, technical analysis is where you're looking purely at the charting side of it. Um, so a lot of analysts, um, uh, you know, then, then once they've worked out whether the business is a good business or a bad business, and let's just assume it's a good business, they then must work through the maths around working out a valuation. And although we won't probably get too much into that today, one of the key things that they do is ultimately work out what the profit is. And they look at, don't look at the profit even just for this year, they look at the profit next year, the year after, the year after. And what they do is they apply a multiple to that. So we talk about a phrase called a PE multiple, a price to earnings multiple. And typically what you find with low quality businesses, and when I say low quality, they have um, unpredictable earnings or they have um, major risks around, to, around their profit, they will get assigned a low PE multiple. Whereas companies that are on high growth trajectories or high, um, highly predictable income streams and, and with a lot of growth, they'll be assigned a higher PE multiple. And ultimately that PE multiple, and so if, if the PE is 20 times uh, and the profit is uh, um, $100 million, 20 times $100 million is $2 billion. That's how they work out what they value the business at. Now, this is where the trick starts. If they've worked out it's worth $2 billion, remember when we worked out a couple of sessions ago where we talked about the market capitalization of a business? The market capitalization, when they look up the business, they might say, oh, hang on, well, the shares are trading at $4. You times that by the number of shares on issue, and it might be the share market is implying that the market capitalization of that business is $4 billion. Hence then what they would say, the analyst would look at their valuation compared to the share market valuation and say, hang on a minute, the share price is well overheated, it's well in advance of our valuation methodology and therefore it's a sell. Vice versa, if their share value, their internal valuation is $2 billion and the share market is only implying a $1 billion share valuation, they, the analyst will look at that differential and go, right, well, we think the share, the share price is worth a lot more than the share market is implying, therefore it's a buy. So working out their valuation is one part of the task. Then you have to compare it to what the share price or the share market is, is valuing it at. And that's how you work out whether something is, is worth buying or not from, from an analyst perspective. So once we get into it, we get into it by talking about fundamental analysis. And what, what are we talking about here is, um, remember that the, the, the share market is we talk about being a forward looking beast. It doesn't worry too much about what happened yesterday or the day before. It's looking at what's gonna to happen tomorrow. And so when the analyst is looking at all the, the uh, issues around a company, you'll be looking at it, things like a pipeline of, of what contracts are potentially gonna be won over the next 10 years or five years. They'll look at product innovation. So for example, in CSL's case at the moment, they might be looking at what is COVID gonna to do to the pipeline of vaccine rollouts for CSL. Uh, they'll be doing, looking at things like new efficiency measures or cost cutting, such as, uh, let's look at the banks at the moment. The banks are cost cutting due to COVID because they're getting rid of all the branches. They're closing branches, they're closing ATM machines because you don't need to have um, uh, cash anymore. And, and potentially a lot of the banks might look at their office space with the work from home policies and be cutting down on their office space. The analyst has to look at all these forward looking events and predict how that's gonna affect their costs. Therefore, what impact is it having on the profit? Uh, other issues they might look at is change in senior management's often an interesting one where you get change at CFO, CEO, 
Um, major position change often causes some disruption and, and it might be questionable as to why they're changing senior management from time to time. So if there's been a change in senior management, the analysts will look at that as well. One thing that we've always looked at is, is typically a very negative um, uh, outcome has been from when you merge or two large companies merge together. Uh, that can uh, often lead to merging of uh, cultures that might be in, not in balance with one another. It might mean uh, IT systems not talking to one another. And a lot of the companies that merge, they talk about cost cutting and all the benefits and synergies and they use all this great language. But quite often we find when two big companies get together, the initial euphoria um, often wears off. Um, other things that you might look at from a fundamental analysis point of view is things like um, even industrial action or the potential for industrial action. So if you're looking at a logistics company like Cube and they have waterfront um, uh, logistics issues, there might be union issues, there might be uh, labour issues and, and you need to be very careful of what the background is from a, from a legislative point of view. So when you're looking at fundamental analysis, there's probably two components to it. There's the story, what we call the story. And I'm gonna use uh, probably one at the moment called uh, Afterpay, which many of you in, in, in listening to this will know. So the story is really simple. It's, it's effectively lay-by on steroids, where you uh, Afterpay is allowing uh, customers um, to buy goods, receive those goods straight away and then pay for it in three or four installments afterwards. If you miss out on any of those payments on a pair of sneakers of $25 a month for four months, then you have to pay a penalty fee. What, how Afterpay have been making their money is they're going to their retailers and saying, hey, we've got this great system, give us a percentage of your sales, and that can be about 3%, 3 to 4%, and, then, and, the, and what's in it for the retailer under the story is that they'll get more sales because they use this Afterpay system. Now, that's the story. Then you have to apply it to the numbers. So then once you've got the story and you might go, okay, after pay, I get that story, what do the numbers look like? What does their balance sheet look like? Do they have a lot of debt? What does their cash flow look like? What does their sales pipeline look like? What are their sales in Australia or overseas look like? And so on. So you have to look at the story first. And if you like the story, that's all great. But what are the numbers then that sit behind that? So analyzing a company is difficult. And, and fundamental analysis is, is quite often um, something that could be beyond a lot of retail investors and hence why we use professional research analysts. But I think it's really important you understand the sort of questions that get asked in the background and what some of the analysts are trying to ask. And, and as I said, bottom line is they're trying to work out what is the growth and the sustainability of this business over the long term? So things that they're gonna be asking the, the, that they meet with investment management and say, where is the growth in this company coming from? So are they gonna do it via acquisitions? Are they going to do it through organic growth? Are they gonna do it through new product development? And, and ultimately, they're gonna be asking um, the, the management about where the threats are too. And, and so you might be looking at a company like Coca-Cola, who is switching over its, um, with the, uh, the sugar issues worldwide in terms of um, dietary requirements. And, and they'll be looking, saying, how are you changing your product mix to suit um, the, the uh, consuming public's needs? So they'll be looking around that, where is that growth coming from? The, the interesting thing they'll also be talking about to a lot of um, the investment management is around what are your profit margins? So how much are you making from which division? Where are, you, um, where, where are margins getting squeezed, such as where are you seeing cost pressures, such as labour costs going up or input costs going up? And also, how much do they control? You're asking them about how much they control their sales, such as um, a lot of resource companies that are selling iron ore or oil, they don't control their sales really much at all because the, the oil price and iron ore price moves on a global context up and down. BHP, don't, BHP Rio and Fortescue don't get to control that at all. Whereas a, a company like Cochlear, which makes those e ear implants, they get to control the cost, sorry, they get to control the sales price of their ear implants. Um, and, and that means that they can dictate to the market what their margins are and what their sales pipeline looks like. And it, so Cochlear often trades at a much higher premium to what a, a resource or mining company trade at. 
Which brings me to another phrase that you might hear around the um, industry is called moat, M-O-A-T. And a moat, in, in basic definition, a moat is like you've got a castle that sits in the, mat, the middle and around it is a moat. And the moat is designed in, uh, in, a, in a, I'll call it in a protection mechanism, is designed to protect the castle from any enemies coming in. And we talk about a moat around the business. And what I mean by that is uh, if you've got a business that's differentiated with a very unique product, it's hard to copy it. And I use Cochlear as a great example um, where they have very high levels of intellectual property that's hard to copy. Um, they then have a very high moat rating, which means it's very hard for competitors to start up tomorrow, come in and compete and do what, um, do what Cochlear is doing. So companies that might have a very low um, moat rating and therefore are priced at a discount might be companies like Afterpay. It may potentially, may, the market may look at it and go, hey, if a competitor to come in and offer this is not very hard, they can put together the systems online and, and copy this product quite easily and quickly. And therefore, those companies are valued at a discount. Um, the other thing that, that fundamentally that we'll be talking to um, management about is, is just how they manage their balance sheet, how much debt do they have, how are they managing their interest costs, um, and how are they managing their cash flow. You're always looking at those sort of things. And again, circling back to one of our previous episodes, you'll be saying, well, if you are making a profit, are you trying to pay that out to shareholders or are you going to be reinvesting that profit back in the business to try and grow it for another day? So where do you source this information from? The most common source of uh, information is from an annual report. Now, you've got to be really careful with annual reports because they come out in, in about September, October every year and they'll be reporting on the numbers up to the 30th of June. Now, by the time, as I said before, by the time you get to September, October, the 30th of June is three or four months old um, and everyone's to a degree moved on. So you, if you're relying on the data in the annual report, it's a good way to maybe get hold of the story, maybe talk a bit about where they're going for the year. And I think it's a great background to look at and to read, but be very mindful that that annual report, by the time you get it and read it, might be six months old. So what you find is a better and more up-to-date version for some of the numbers you look at is get stockbrokers research or online research um, from a, a stockbroking um, or a research analyst or research house like Morningstar, Lonsec or you might pay um, to get a newsletter. You want the information probably as up-to-date as you possibly can get it. But in itself, an annual report, I often read the, uh, the chairman's report, often gives very good direction about where the business is going overall and strategically what their goals are. And I often read the CEO report, which is really more of an operational outlook. And it gives you, again, another very good flavour for where the last year has been and what the problems and the, well, the good, the bad and the ugly has been and also what they're expecting for the next 12 months. So let's just talk a bit about a couple of ratios and I just want to give you a couple of simple examples. So financial ratios are something that, that this uh, probably go beyond a bit around this talk, but it's really important that if you want to get particularly good at looking at share investments, you should understand and, and dig into more detail with. But the first one I'm going to give you is a thing called dividend per share, DPS. And what dividend per share equals is simply the, um, the, the total dividend paid. Now, the total dividend paid um, comes back to, remember that was if the profit of the company was $100 million, it might keep $30 million um, for uh, growth, future growth opportunities, and then it might pay out in dividends the other $70 million. Now that $70 million is the total dividend paid. If then it's the total number of shares on issue. So if the total dividend paid is 70 million, divided by the amount of shares on issue, and if there's, um, uh, let's say there's uh, 100 million shares on issue, you simply, it works out at then seven cents per share dividend. So then, then that gets times by the number of shares that you hold, which gives you your dividend payment. Total dividend paid divided by the number of shares gives the dividend per share. Now to take that one step further, then you need to work out the dividend yield. And the dividend yield 
is, and we've talked about it once before, but just to reiterate it, is the dividend per share, how much that you get per share, divided by the share price. So in this case, our dividend per share was seven cents. If the current share price is um, one dollar, that equals a 7% return on your share price. So you're getting seven cents per share back divided by the share price, gives you a, an income return of 7%. Now, again, it's really crucial that you understand that 7% is just the dividend component. And going back a couple of sessions we talked about, that don't forget that companies, they make profit, they withhold a lot of money for growth, which you, you know, you, that should then translate into a higher share price as well. So you firstly work out the dividend per share, which is generally pretty easy. Then you work out what the dividend yield is um, uh, as a basis from the share price. So just recapping a couple of key things to remember, that when you own shares, um, you are an absolute part owner in that business. Going back right back to session one, where I said that, you know, if you own a thousand shares in Woolworths, you're an owner in that Woolworths. And, and like I said at the start, it doesn't mean that you get to go down aisle 12 of the Woolworths at Mitcham and boss everybody around, but you are entitled to a percentage of the profits. Remember also then I said to, to make an informed decision if you want to be an owner of that business, you need to understand how that company operates and what its prospects are. Why do you own it? Um, and, and again, I'm not saying that you need to be an expert in it, but um, you know, don't be, uh, I call it, don't have a herd mentality or a sheep mentality, just doing it because everybody else is doing it. Stop, ask yourself some questions, read the annual report, and then say, hey, do I really want to own shares in this business? And one of the most important sources of information for that business has been an annual report. And, and on top of that, you can then get um, research reports which provide a bit of an overlay and an understanding of that annual report. Um, therefore, and then lastly, don't forget that to compare our investments, that's where we do ratio analysis. So we're comparing one company against a comp other company based on the different ratios, such as PE ratios, dividend yields, and dividends per share. So then we move on to technical analysis. Now technical analysis is, is very different in a lot of respects from fundamental analysis because all we are looking is at a share price chart, charting as it's otherwise known. And ultimately charting is designed to look at the chart and work out whether there are buy signals and sell signals of a certain share based on its price behavior. And ultimately charting probably relies on um, the, the market telling you what they think is going on. And I'll give you, I guess, a, a, a sim simple example straight off the bat. So if you see a chart and you see the share price moving in a, it, and it ultimately and it's moving down in a band like that, it's in a down, what we call a downward trend. And as long as it doesn't, it stays within that channel, those two lines, as soon as it moves out of that trend, as soon as it breaks that, that point there may be deemed a buy signal. But as long as it's trading in that trend downwards, it's still a sell signal. And it, again, it doesn't, it means that you should stay out of the share and not buy it. You're looking for a, a break of the pattern and then at that juncture, that could become a buy signal. Similarly, if you look at the exact opposite of that in terms of an upward trend, it could be moving up, moving up, moving up, moving up. And as long as it stays in that upward trend as the market would talk about, it, it's saying you should hold on to that share. If you've already got it, hold on to it. Don't sell it because it's in this trend pattern. As soon as it breaks that point on the lower channel point, that is when it says pure charters would go sell. Now, a lot of people go, oh, well, hang on, Tony, it drops down below there. There might be no news around. So the fundamental analysts are going, there's no sell signal, there's no nothing going on. What this implies though, is that there are still people that are selling the stock that might know more than the analysts know. And so they're running out and selling it and therefore creating the downward pressure in the market that's causing the share price to fall. So the share, the, the, basically the argument is that the share price knows more than the analysts know, which I would argue to a degree is, is very true. Um, one of the other things about charting is that as long as this company, you see these points here, A, 
and B and C, they are defined as what we call making higher lows. So every time, and as long as it's making higher lows and D, E, F and making higher highs, it stays, the pattern stays true. So as long as these, these lower lows on the dips are continuing to hold firm and the higher highs are staying firm, that's seen as a positive uptrend. And therefore, as long as it holds inside those channels, these are buy signals here. As it turns around, it hits the channel and bounces back up. So as I said, we don't even know that, we're, I don't have a name of the share on here, whether it's BHP or Rio Tinto, no one really, chartists don't really care. They're just looking at the pure chart and working out what, when you should buy and sell it based on that. So the other very, um, I'll call it basic charting technique is around resistance and support lines. And, and these are, um, are fundamental to what you will see in a, a share price behavior. So with that again, we talk about um, a, a share price that might be trading in a band sideways. So it's got a, this is called a, um, a resistance line, this top line. So the share price is going up, oh, it hits there, comes back down, that's resistance there. Then it hits this line down here and that's called the support line. So it supported at this point and it seems to hit a bit of a wall of selling here. So you, you can typically look at channel trends like that and every time it gets to the resistance level, get out of it if you're a, tra you're a trader and simply buy back in when it hits the support line. Here though, the trick is interesting. So if the share price keeps going above that resistance line, it's often defined as a major buy signal because it means something's probably changed. And if you see it going above that, you'll see a lot of charting analysts come out and say, yes, it's broken its resistance line, therefore it's a buy. This is explained by this chart. Similarly, if this chart went the other way and broke the support line, you would, it would be defined as a sell. It's broken its support and therefore they're not sure where it's gonna head next and therefore you should get out. One of the other big key indicators of charting, particularly when you're looking at this support and resistance levels, is you might see it break above, and I'll you go back to this break above into this buy territory here, it's broken its resistance level. But what you're looking for, and you, every day you can, you'll measure the amount of volume. Um, and remember the volume is the total amount of shares that have been traded per, for that day. If you see it break its resistance line on increasing volume, that is often a very, very good sign. If you, with increasing volume, with a buy signal, um, is, is seen as a very, uh, a very bullish behavior. Similarly, if you see increasing volume with a sell signal, that also reinforces the view. If you see volumes flatten out and it's, they're no different, it might be a false indicator, so you just have to dive a little bit, dig, uh, dive a little bit um, deeper into the, the pattern behavior. One of the other really uh, key good key indicators for, for buying and selling shares is, is a, um, a system that particularly I like and, um, and, and I know a lot of analysts like this too. It's, it, they talk about a thing called moving averages. And a moving average um, line um, is basically an average of the share prices over a period of time. And what we mean by that, if you've got a share price that's moving up and down and, and around and around. And what the moving average, if you have a, I'll call it a, a 30 day moving average, it takes the average share price of the last 30 days. And that 30 day line might move, you know, pretty much and it just smooths out all the day to day noise of the share price. You might then have what's called a, a longer time frame line, a 120 day or 180 day um, moving average. And what you're looking for is major changes in the moving average. So if you've got the 120 day moving line, and if that, then if the, the 100 and, uh, if the 30 day average falls below the 120 day average, that means it's, it's clearly uh, on a downward trend and it's a sell signal. Vice versa, if it cuts the other way, it means it's a buy signal. And what moving averages tend to do is, is keep you invested in a stock for longer. And I'll show you that again on this chart, is that as long as this share price here stays above 
the 30 day moving average. It's, it's saying, hey, it's going okay, the trend's still intact. It's maybe not until it cuts the 30 day average that they believe there might be a change in the pattern, which would provide a sell signal. So moving averages, there's plenty of material around on those and you can do lots and lots of homework on moving averages. But I find that it'll probably do one or two things. It'll keep you in stocks for longer on the upside and you won't get the peak and you won't get perhaps the bottom, but it will probably keep you in major market moves up and it'll probably keep you out of major market moves down. What I then, just to finish off with today, I just wanted to say that this has um, been really a pleasure delivering this four series to you all. Um, I know that the share market is a big beast and, and we could probably run this for, for many, many more hours and there's lots and lots of questions. But I hope this has been a great taste of what it's like to get involved in the share market, that you start to understand it better, that you start to educate yourselves and take responsibility for some of this investing in the share market yourselves. Um, I know that it's certainly been a passion of mine and something that I've pretty been keen to deliver to you all. And I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you've got any questions, feel free to reach out to myself or the team and uh, best of luck with your investing.